I'm Erin O'Byrne and welcome to Everything EFL Podcast. I'm passionate about serving teachers and I offer training for schools and institutions whose language teachers need a little refresher, a change of mindset and some super practical ideas to put into their classrooms straight away. There is no one size fits all lesson plan, but you've got a friend and support system in me. I can help reduce your overwhelm, give you some teacher inspiration and improve your work-life balance. How? With some solid advice, takeaways you can try out immediately and some much needed teacher love because your well-being is important too. Are you ready to make small changes one step at a time and remember how amazing you are? Let's go. Hello, you gorgeous teacher. If you're one of my lovely regular listeners, welcome back. If you're brand new to everything EFL podcast, you are most welcome and I hope you stick around. I hope you're having a nice, peaceful, mindful week. I have just finished session four of my Methods of Mindset course where we focused on mindfulness, primarily in the classroom, but there was a conversation about remembering to be mindful yourself. So I'm just going to throw this out to you and a little challenge for this week is just to encourage yourself to take a few moments of every day, even if it's just a few moments to breathe, or even five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, whatever you can manage, do something that brings you joy and make sure that you're in the present moment. Next week, we are doing Sharing is Caring, where we'll be talking about community. And with that word share, I would also like to encourage you to share, share, share this podcast with your colleagues. Um, Talk about me in your staff room, share your favourite episode or just share the link to the podcast. Anyway, what are we here for today? We are talking about the passive. Now, this is quite a big topic, so we'll get to the ins and outs of it in a bit. Um, I'm going to talk about my week last week, and then I'll wrap up the episode with things that you should or may need to consider when teaching the passive. Now, before we start, it's important to note my context. I have quite a lot of time. You know, I have the same students every day. They're adults, they live and work in Dublin, and they've all studied it before. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later too. So take what you want from this episode and apply it to your particular context. So you probably won't be able to use everything I did, but I do think you can take some inspiration from this because there's a lot of common sense at the end of it. So some of the issues that my students have was, and this is been observed by me in in the past just from teaching is students have learned this students have learned the passive multiple times and they seem to kind of know the technical aspect of it you know like to be plus past participle but they always have an issue with it when they actually go to use it and and in some cases recognize it and so we're going to try and address all of those things as well so Basically, what I thought was, because I asked my students the week before, have you studied this before? Yes. Okay, so I thought, okay, I'm not going to use the textbook, which had quite an interesting text about wolves and ecosystems in Yellowstone Park. But, yeah, you know, so I thought, okay, I'll go with a newspaper article that I found online. I kind of asked them what context they wanted to look at and blah, blah, blah. And we we found a newspaper article together and I thought I'm going to start with a noticing exercise you know we'll have a look at the the um, article we'll summarize it for context and then I thought I'll give you a noticing exercise where you basically have to identify the passive structures if you've studied this a bunch of times before which they all said they had this shouldn't be too difficult what did I say last week about assumptions (laughs) so I thought it would take 10 minutes but it took more like 20 Um, and still like when we did the feedback They didn't spot all of them. And also there were a few examples where the verb to be is omitted, which is very common in news articles, um, and they didn't spot those. And then I also wrote on the board, you know, can you find any sentences in the article that match to, um, you know, we don't know who did the action, it's obvious who did the action, it doesn't matter, or just focus of the sentence, you know? They were okay with that. Um, The present perfect seemed to confuse them a lot. Even in active sentences, when they're trying to spot the passive, they will often mistake a present perfect active sentence for a passive sentence. And it's probably uh, to do with the past participle part. But, you know, I just found it quite surprising that my students had studied it, I think, a minimum of four times, possibly up to six or seven. And they still didn't really recognize it. They didn't really get it. You know, and one of them sort of said at the end, like, so so when do you use it? You know, so I was like, okay, how did you learn it? Um, and turns out it was the usual, there's a text, you do a bit of rules, there's a gap fill, and then you try and speak, you know, and then also transformation exercises. And they were like, yeah, that's kind of how we did it. So I was like, okay, well, that's fine. You learned it, I suppose we can say the traditional way. And then I asked them to write down any questions they had. What do you want to ask me? 
um, and then I'll try and sort of deal with those things over the week. So one thing that came up was the past perfect. Uh, another question was, when do we use it? Um, when can we omit to be? Uh, and somebody commented that it's just difficult to recognize. So for me, it was obvious that the way that it has been taught, just it's not working. So I tried to find a different angle. And, you know, you find this controversial. I personally think it's common sense. But I thought, OK, why don't I provide them with lots of examples, lots of exposure, but little or no production? If we have time later in the week, maybe I'll have a speaking activity ready. But speaking is not the aim. OK, this was not my aim. I was more focused on the process, not the product or the outcome. We can pick up production later with sort of mini tasks. Um, we can mix it in with receptive noticing exercises. You know, in the weeks to come, you can do little exercises to bring them back to the passive and stuff. But, you know, what do students need to be aware of? Well, first of all, context. The obvious ones, crime, news, movies, processes, inventions, discoveries, things like that. And again, you know, with the time, we and you won't have time to cover all of those. But, you know, at least we can let them know these are the contexts and we can kind of choose one maybe um, that, is familiar to them so and then I thought okay we often see this in newspapers and on signs and that's fine and it makes it easy to find resources but it occurred to me these are upper intermediate students how about showing examples of the passive used in spoken English surely that would be useful or more useful so I made a dialogue um, I used ChatGPT and then I made like a, a basic like this sort of big document where they kind of had everything they needed. Right. So the dialogue came first. Then there was I extracted sort of all of the, the verbs out of out of that dialogue and had them in, like, in sections according to tense. And then I copied and pasted examples of signs and headlines where to be was omitted and also a list of common passive verbs. So everything was there, um, but we did it bit by bit. So first of all, we did the dialogue. Um, I input specific phrases to ChatGPT and then I tweaked it. Things like I'm supposed to, what's it called? My room's been decorated. So I tried to think of really everyday situations, but also an example of every tense where the passive is used. And what I mean is like, you know, language and grammar are very much connect connected and if you think about like my rooms being decorated the the verb decorated we very often do use it in the present continuous don't we um i mean it's not the only one we use it in but it's definitely one uh what's it called very generally very often in the present simple for example so these are all things i considered before generating the dialogue and then I am um, asked, you know, which examples in the dialogue relate to crime, accidents, inventions, processes, blah, blah, blah. Not all of them did. You know, we could all always go back to the fact that the focus of the sentence is the object if it doesn't, you know, particularly apply to these particular contexts. But noticing and, and making those connections are really, really useful, you know, with contexts. So I extracted the super common phrases from the dialogue onto the board like what's it called and then I showed them again how you know grammar and vocab are connected so like I said just before what's it called very often in the present simple very often in the past simple as well but I would argue present simple more and as we know spoken and written are different discourses therefore the verbs will be different as well so moving on to the headlines I just found some examples online um, and what we did here was we just it was like a, a noticing. We just touched on it. Nothing in depth. More like exposure and move on. My aim, again, was to show different contexts and examples, but not necessarily get really into it and get them to produce. And then I did the same thing with signs, right? And here's just a little side note here. And the, again, this is another little aspect of passive. You can touch upon and move on. So one of the signs was masks must be worn. And we talked about who would say this, how it would be said in an active way. You must wear a mask. And I said, this is a great example of using the passive to sound um, a little less direct and polite. So again, there's there's so much to the passive. And again, you choose how much you want to introduce, how much you just want to leave for the moment, depending on whether they've studied it before, whether it's relevant. But, you know, these guys will all be too. They're very they're quite voracious when they want to know things. But again, we touched upon it. We talked about it and then we moved on to the next thing. And I told them this. We're not going to spend too much time on this. I'm just showing you. This is the idea behind it. Exposure, noticing. They're very familiar with this word because I use it all the time. And then we had a little conversation about get because get carried away was in the dialogue. And that was actually something that ChatGPT generated. But I thought I'll leave it in one because it's a great phrase. And two, it's an example of how we use get in the passive to replace to be. And I just talked about, you know, we use it when the situation is unexpected and especially um, unpleasant. So, you know, get mugged, get robbed, get killed, get injured. So, you know, 
we put the examples on the board and then we moved on. But like, can you see what I mean by passive being a big topic? <laughs> and I think students do appreciate it if you touch upon these things with some really common recognisable examples. Now, one student actually said, oh, I've heard people using get like this before, but I didn't realise it was passive. Brilliant light bulb moment for the student. It reaffirmed my idea of using a dialogue instead of written text because you're going to hear this more than you're going to read it, right? And then another little side note, you know, there's there's that kind of academic, more formal passive, like it is said, it is estimated, it is expected. I didn't bother with that. You know, I don't want it to be too grammar heavy. Um, and I just really wanted to focus on sort of real world kind of spoken stuff. Um, and on the second day, the students were more visibly relaxed and engaged. And, and I think it's because the examples that I gave, they could connect with, you know, like with the dialogue, they saw themselves having this conversation. The context was, you know, two students chatting about life, work and friends in Dublin. So it's a real world conversation. So I asked them again, do you want to, you know, have a look at this dialogue and um, spot the, the passive structures again, just like we did with the newspaper article? Or do you want to go straight to the extracted sentences and talk about them? And they were like, no, no, we'll try and spot it. And they did much better this time. Now, I didn't have any verbs with to be, whether to be is omitted. I made it a little bit more simple than that. But they pretty much spotted everything, which is good because you want your tasks to be achievable. And yesterday when I realised it wasn't so achievable, I simplified it and made it achievable. That's going to motivate them. And then um, there was just a comprehensive page of information where I had all the, the contexts um, and th all the rules of the passive. Um, again, just for their reference. If I'd had more time, I probably would have cut the um, table up into, you know, functions and examples, but we didn't really have time for that. And again, we kind of talked about it a little bit. And so I was just like, look, the information is here. Have a quick look. Is there anything that you want to talk about? Now, usually I wouldn't do this. I would make it much more guided discovery. But a lot of this stuff isn't new at this point. It's just a refresher. So let's just keep moving with the lesson. Again, if you don't agree with me, that's absolutely fine. I'm just telling you what I did. The next day, I decided to get students to contextualize verbs themselves, build context around verbs. So I provided them with a list of common verbs. Now, I did break my own rule. It was a little bit of overload. Um, I basically said, have a look through the list of verbs. And if there are any we d you don't understand, we'll talk about them. I'll put some examples on the board. But that actually ended up taking most of the lesson because there were a lot that they wanted examples of. So it gave me a chance to give examples of common phrases that again are more spoken rather than written. So for example, the verb to be done, you know, I, I said, okay, we might use this when we're talking about friendships. Like, I'm done with her. She's an energy vampire. Or are you done? Right, like, are you finished? Uh, and again, another side note here. Um, there are tons of phrases like this, like, are you done? Um, I've never been here before. I'd rather not thank you. That don't really have any context, but are super common and can be used in a million different contexts. So instead of just writing, are you done? Yes. Give a bit of context. So write a two to three line dialogue and then get students to copy that down. So something like, um, I'm done. Are you? Almost. I just have to finish this last exercise. You know? Again, no context, no connection, no learn. Be delivered, your package is being delivered. Um, so again, just trying to give suitable tenses and examples they can relate to or come across in everyday life. However, like I said, um, the pro, yeah, exploring the language, common phrases, brilliant. And then I got students to choose which verbs and phrases they're particularly interested in. But like I said, con, overload, not much time to create. Um, but at the same time, all of this kind of dealt with the why of it all, the process. Again, let's talk about the process. Let's talk about those tenses. It's, I think it's a lot more useful than just throwing gap fills at them and then getting them to speak when they might not quite be ready. Like, okay, I'm using the passive here, but I don't really know why. I think it's because my teacher wants me to use it. Do you know what I mean? So we've d done about the why. So let's talk about those dreaded tenses. So back of the book, very predictable, a couple of gap fill exercises. Not ideal, but not going to spend any time with this in class. I said, do this for your homework. Uh, basically, this is more about just getting to grips with the tenses. So, you know, read the sentence very carefully. What tense do you think it is? Right. And they can try and work that out on their own. And we could talk about it in the lesson. Inevitably, no one did it. My students all work. Um, <laughs> so I said, OK, Let's do it in class. And I thought it would take five or 10 minutes. It took them about 20 or 25 minutes. And again, it's the tenses. It's the trouble with the tenses. All of the gaps were passive. They knew that, but it was figuring out which tense to use. Now, the first exercise was your straightforward one to eight gap fill. 
don't like those but again let's focus on the tenses um the second one was more like um a paragraph which is better you got a bit of context i elicited the context it was a process it was like how packages are delivered or something like that but again we talked about okay lots of present simple there brilliant um and then i had a test with them on friday i generated it on chat gpt because i asked it to give exposure to real world situations and real world verbs where the passive is used and it actually did quite a good job and again what you're doing is here you're not asking them to fill the gaps you're not asking them to mechanically produce you're asking them to think about it this is missing i have four options i'm going to think about it and that's much better i think for students brains and it takes less time as well and again, it's receptive rather than productive. Um, we did have one speaking exercise at the end from Teach This called Name Three Things. It's a nice, it's a nice little activity, but that was the only production I asked them to do. Okay, so that might be a bit higgledy piggledy, um, but I was just trying out new things. Like, and you know me, I don't take a lot of time to plan. If I had planned it better, maybe it would have been slightly tighter. But I just want you to throw different things at them and see how they reacted. I think that's an important part of teaching, just trying new stuff. So I did. Um, and I've reflected and I've realized the things that could be better, maybe I shouldn't have done. So that's grand too, you know, if you're trying something new, don't expect it to be perfect. Just just take take mental notes at the end of it and see how, what your students react to. And one of them actually said to me at the end, like, because I said, how do you feel about it now, blah, blah, blah. And one of them actually said to me, you have a different system. And I take that as a compliment. So to wrap up, okay, I have six tips for you. One, don't expect too much production. Focus on exposing your learners to lots of examples and familiar contexts. Real life and real world, please. Not sure? Go online, look at dictionaries, uh, corpus if you can. ChatGPT can generate some common phrases for you. Grammar websites. And then use your instinct and knowledge of the language. Look at the examples that you are being shown. What would you use and you say in your daily life? For example, what are you going to hear more? The file will have been moved by me or the building was knocked down or demolished 10 years ago. Yeah, use your common sense. Number two, don't forget spoken English. Don't just rely on those newspapers and articles in your textbook. Use dialogues and think about examples of verbs and phrases commonly used in spoken real world situations. Number three, touch upon things and move on. If you know your students are struggling with the basics, stick to the basics, even if they've done it before and they have questions. Brilliant, but don't go on too much of a tangent. Just give a couple of examples and move on, right? And maybe, you know, introduce it later as a noticing task in the future. If you're finished with the passive and you're doing a dialogue, you know, like from, you're using your course book or your dialogue, and then you're looking at the transcript afterwards, and then you might see uh, an example of the passive with the verb get, and you can go, oh, do you remember we talked about that? You know, that's it, touch upon it, move on, let's go. You could have a quick conversation about how it's in a different context, you know, because exposure to different contexts, context switching, very important. Again, you're focusing more on the process here. Little production, just lots of real world examples. Number four, avoid transformation. Isolated sentences with no context. All you're doing is asking them to convert active to passive. It doesn't mean they understand how the passive is used or when they should use it. If you're saying change this to passive, they're going to change it to passive. So what? Noticing guys, receptive activities. Number five, tests. Again, make sure the examples are real world. I found a test that I was going to use because it was multiple choice. But when I had a closer look at the examples, it was like the business letter will be written tomorrow. What? When have you ever heard anyone say that? So I scrapped it and went on to chat GPT. Make sure you ask it for real world examples or input the verbs you want them to want chat GPT to actually use in the test. And again, multiple choice, not gap fill. And number six, which, you know, this kind of leads me to my final point. Um, tenses are something that cause a lot of trouble. They might understand the passive when, the context, but the tenses are a nightmare, especially the perfect and continuous forms. You know, you've got like two verbs before you get to the past participle. So again, try not to give them too many gap fills. Uh, for homework, maybe. Um, give them multiple choice. Let them think about the sentence, the context and choose. It's much easier on the brain and faster in class. So that's it, guys. I hope that helps. Um, I just think that we do need to address grammar in a slightly different way. And it doesn't mean completely abandoning, you know, the old ways. We can still match the rules and do guided discovery and all of that. But just make sure students have really good examples and they actually know when to use it. You know, it's so important. Um, and I'm sure we've all been there when we've taught something and we know it's not the first time and we've spent loads of time doing it and they still can't produce a sentence at the, at the end of the week or the next week. So 
think about how to put a different spin on it and maybe include more receptive stuff. Don't always go for production straight after your gap fill or whatever it is you're doing. Um, stick with the gap fill if you have to, but don't just expect them to produce. Um, and if you're giving them like a task where they have to produce an isolated sentence just to produce the language, ask yourself, what good is that doing? Because next week, they're not going to be able to even produce that. Okay. Lots to think about, guys. Um, I'd love to know your comments. I discovered not long ago that you can actually comment um, on a Spotify episode. So if you're listening on Spotify, um, shoot me a comment or you can DM me, you can email me. All of my details are in the show notes. And like I said, guys, share, share, share. Share this episode. Share the link to everything EFL. Talk to your director of studies or your school manager or your administrators about me. I'm available for in-house and online sessions as well. I think I might be going to Germany early next year, which is very exciting to do an in-house session. Um, and I'm currently working on a project with French Guyana to deliver online sessions there. And I also have done one more session in Dublin, which went really, really well. I'm, I'm honing my skills. I feel myself becoming a better trainer the more I do. So that's exciting for me. And I hope it's exciting for you too. Um, I would love to work with you. Um, if not, just join my newsletter. You know, it's a weekly newsletter. It's not too intrusive. I give you a tip or advice, or sometimes it's just to remind you how amazing you are. Um, yeah, so just keep in touch, guys. I'm always here to help. I live to serve my gorgeous darling teachers, and that includes you. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. And I'm just going to end with my final and usual wish for you, which is have a safe and peaceful week. Look after yourselves and share the love. Bye. <laughs>